Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Strat Chat webinar session. Uh, we're just getting started. In the meantime, as you're logging into the session, why don't you take a moment to think about what you hope to learn from today's chat with uh, uh, co-founder Alex Osterwalder and our guest, uh, Rita McGrath. Uh, we'll be starting in just a moment. You can share it in the chat box uh, in Zoom or in the question box, or you can tweet to us at Strategizer with the hashtag StratChat. We'll be just starting in a minute as everyone's getting settled into the room. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Rita. We're just getting started with the session. Um, Lovely. We'll be, I'm just doing the intro and then we'll be over to you and Alex soon. Lovely. Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Like I said, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to uh, another Strat Chat webinar session. Today's session is about eight practices that help you see around corners. And it's a very particular statement that has uh, been brought to us by our special guest today and a good friend and collaborator. And we're gonna dig into that more in a little bit. But just to go through some of the housekeeping rules, as always, I'm your moderator, Kavya Gupta. I manage content and community at Strategizer. Our host is co-founder of Strategizer, Alex Osterwalder, also co-author of best-selling business books, Business Model Generation and Value Proposition Design. Our guest is a frequent friend, uh, frequent Strat Chat guest, and a renowned world thinker and professor, uh, Rita McGrath. And as always, we actually now have back in the fold our friend Holger, who will be facilitating the session from a visual illustration standpoint. So you'll get to see the conversation drawn out as both Alex and Rita are having a chat about this topic. If at any point you wanna mention a comment, you have feedback or just a question, you can stick it into the Zoom questions box. I'll be monitoring them and we will uh, hopefully have a chance to do Q&A in this webinar session. But if you also wanna send us other comments about this topic, um, tweet us at Strategizer with the hashtag StratChat. And I also encourage you to go to blog.strategizer.com to read more or to get access to more resources that are associated with the topic we're talking about today, um, as well as other areas of innovation uh, in value proposition design and value innovation. So with that, I'm just going to also point out that the uh, next book that we're working on is called The Invincible Company. I believe it's a working title. Alex, you might have to jump in at some point and let me know if that's not the case. However, it's the third book. It's a sequel to both business model generation and value proposition design. It's currently in process. You can go to the website. I will send the link uh, during the webinar to point you to the sign up so you can get notified on the updates. Essentially, the book is about how game changers and visionaries continuously reinvent business models. And the hands on book contains several practical and essential tools, including the business portfolio map, innovation metrics the culture map, and a series of illustrated business model mechanics. Alex and the content team have been hard at work on this next release, uh, hopefully coming out within the next, uh, within this year. Uh, and like I said, I will pass the link during the session and in the follow-up email to all attendees so they can sign up and get notified on the book. With that, I'm gonna pass it over. Holger's already got the reins. So uh, Alex, why don't you take a moment to just tell us why um, it was so important to have Rita for this talk again uh, and why the contents of her new book are so important to the business world. So first of all, uh, welcome, uh, Rita. <laughs> it's Hi, really great it's a here. pleasure to be here. And um, I, you know, the, the reason why we bring on Rita as much as we can in, in the Strat Chats is very simple because she has probably some of the world's leading knowledge around how to help established companies reinvent themselves and is very practical. And it is always a pleasure to have a chat with Rita. And if we can do this publicly, even better, and time usually flies. And there's a special reason right now because Rita is publishing or you know, gonna launch a new book pretty soon. So with that, let me immediately get started 
Uh, Rita, and we're in the process of writing a book. You finished a book. When is it coming out? Uh, the official publication date is September 3rd. And I'm actually going to be in Europe on that date. So in a bit of a twist for American authors, we're actually launching the book in Europe. Excellent, excellent. And as we know, you have a global impact. Anyways, it's good to have you launch this and kick this off in, in Europe. Tell us a, a little bit uh, about the book. It's about these eight practices that help you see around corners, right? What, what motivated you to write this, uh, this new book? You have a couple of bestsellers already out there. Um, what's, what's, what's really the core and what was the motivation for this, for this book? Well, as you know, Alex, my last book was called uh, The End of Competitive Advantage. And the thesis of that book was that this idea that we have had in strategy for a long time of sustainable competitive advantage can actually be something of a trap. It causes people to go into defensive mode. It blocks them from really seeing the challenges that their business truly faces. And it doesn't allow them to you know, think proactively about their future in many cases. If you're so obsessed with defending an existing advantage, then you're not really out there looking for new ones. Um, and that idea got very pretty well accepted. And together with a lot of your work on innovation, one of the core pillars of that book was that Innovation proficiency is not optional when you're in a world that, where competitive advantages change a lot, right? Um, so that then leads to the obvious question of, well, how do I know when? <laughs> and people were asking me about that. And uh, that, you know, I noodled on that for a while. And that got me started looking at strategic inflection points. And as many of your listeners will know, this was a topic that Andy Grove was writing about back in the 90s. And he was really thinking about Intel and the challenges it faced in its business model. And he, his book was famously called Only the Paranoid Survive. But there really hasn't been a whole lot done on the topic of strategic inflection points since then. And so you know, it kind of lurked around in the back of my mind for a while. And then it crystallized with the observation that these things don't happen overnight. If you look at most things that we feel as a dramatic strategic inflection point, either in business or in our lives, um, if you really go back and look, you can see that they've been brewing for quite some time. And that, you know, if you had the processes in place to pick up the early warnings, you could have perhaps made a move much earlier than if you just waited for it to be obvious to everyone. So the real motivation behind the book was how do we pick up these really early warnings? How do we then decide what to do about them? And how do we bring the organization with us? Maybe for those um, listeners uh, that are a little bit less familiar with the concept of strategic inflection points, be before we go into the content of, of your next book, tell us a little bit about the concept of strategic inflection points. Sure. So Grove's definition was that a strategic inflection point represents a change in the assumptions that you make about your business. So I would deepen that definition a little bit further as follows. Um, every business has a set of constraints that it operates under, um, which are born basically of what was available to you at the time the business was founded. And the as your business matures, you develop sets of key metrics, you develop key assumptions, you develop ways of looking at the world. And over time, those come to represent reality in your mind. So an inflection point is something that fundamentally shifts the constraints that your business operates under. And that could be positive. You know, it can open up vast new opportunities or it can be negative. You can miss it and it can take your business into decline. So a strategic inflection point is a and a set of um, processes or activities that change the fundamental assumptions your business operates under. Wonderful. So these eight practices that help you see around corners is, is, is uh, helping you kind of address this further. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people are now curious, should we dive into those eight practices? Sure. This is actually the first chapter of the book. It's called Excellent. A Snow Melts from the Edges. 
Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I like to use that phrase is it's a real encouragement to people that, that, you know, inflection points and the early warnings don't present themselves neatly on the conference table in your corporate headquarters. <laughs> you know, they're out <laughs> at the edges. They're where, um, you know, they're where, where weird things are being said about your company or there's a strange new technology that's making things shift or there's, you know, there's something going on out there. But a lot of times executives miss them because they're so involved in the day to day. And I see that a lot. People say, oh, I'm, I'm too busy to do that, you know, and what are they busy doing? They're busy, you know, driving their business off a cliff because they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so um, a, qu a quick one. Do you think companies feel this urgency more to act? Like, of course, all of the leadership, you know, the CEOs and leaders and boards know that these um these changes are happening faster, but it almost seems to me sometimes like they're not acting. Are you seeing a change in that, that they're actually taking these big challenges on? Or is it, you know, okay, we can survive long enough until, you know, we've done our job and then the next people are, the next uh, leaders are going to have to suffer the, the, the impact. Do you see yeah. a change in behavior? I, the, the minority of companies are really prepared to face these challenges boldly. And I think, unfortunately, Alex, um, you know, very often it's this, well, I, I, I can see clear the next two, three years, it's not going to take me out now. So I'll just cling on there until my time is done and then let the next person worry about it. I think that's unfortunately far more prevalent. I was um, just yesterday, I was at the Innovation Roundtable conference, um, which was held at W.L. Gore's headquarters here in the U.S. and was talking to someone from a very, very well-regarded science-based company. Um, and he basically said to me that they have decided to disband their R&D operations. Wow. Can you believe that? I was, I, I, I was speechless. And you know me, Alex, I'm seldom speechless. I was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I could not believe my uh, ears. I said, you're doing what? He said, we're disbanding our R&D operations. I said, well, what? What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, what's that's the whole basis for your reason for being. Um, and he said, well, you know, we invested all this money in R&D in the past and it hasn't paid off. And I said, well, you know, that's probably not because of your R&D. That's probably because of something else about the way your company is being managed. And yet the leadership has taken that as a signal that there's no point investing in R&D. So I, I just don't know what to tell you. So unfortunately, I think all too much right now we've got this economic short-termism we've got shortened time horizons and people really aren't making the investments that would create the future for all of us it's a it's a grave concern of mine so they seem to be seeing this coming right but but they're not acting enough so let's let's play this through maybe with with a with an example that happened in the past and how companies you know might have you know better reacted so if we take an older example when Skype disrupted or in general voice over IP disrupted the voice part of telecommunications, it, it was pretty interesting to, to see that the telecom operators didn't believe that free could actually be a real thing, right? Because they were looking at the Skype through the lens of their business model. What exactly. could telecom operators have done at the time to react to this threat or maybe even, you know, as you say, react earlier before it was was too late what could they have done well i think the starting point for all of this is you really have to go to the customer and ask yourself what's the job that customer is trying to get done so that's that's a concept clay christensen invented which i think is incredibly powerful and he argues that you know we don't actually buy products and services what we do is we hire them to get jobs done in our lives and when you look at what people wanted right from from telecommunications um there was a huge pent-up demand because back in the day you know long distance was ferociously expensive and prohibitively expensive so if you wanted to you know connect with friends and family that were far flung you really didn't have a whole lot of options um and so the what i refer to that situation is 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 you've got you've got hostages you don't have customers <laughs> you know about they're not doing business with you because they want to they're doing business with you because they have no choice so as a telecom operator i think the smarter thing to do would have been to go back and ask the question not how can we make as much money as possible because we are the only game in town, we're a monopoly. And instead think about how could we get paid, you know, by actually doing something customers want, that we're aligning ourselves with what our customers want. So 
prior to Skype, right, you could have come up conceivably with special packages that would leverage your, your technology that would create more of a, a constellation of services, say, that customers would buy from you that Skype couldn't act easily copy. Um, you could have made it financially less attractive for an organization like Skype to come in. Um, you could have figured out uh, you know, how, what, what are the things customers want aside from raw connectivity and would they come to us as the provider of choice rather than hanging on to that monopoly for as long as we possibly can and then sort of grudgingly give way once, once the cat's out of the bag. So, you know, my, my big encouragement would be, you know, to stop looking at your business model to use your work as something that you're going to maximize to the to the distrust and dislike of your customers and start to think of yourself as being allied with the interests of your customers. And I think, you know, telecom had a long history of monopoly. And so a lot of the people making decisions in those companies never really thought of it from the customer's point of view. They only thought of it from, you know, how do we make the most possible money on international calls? So one of the things you said that, that's interesting at the beginning that innovation is at the edges. So Lauren from our content team, she asks, well, if, if innovation is at the edges, how do you actually change the company culture so you can bring it to the center? Do, what do you do? You know, is, is it a metrics change or how, what, if, if I'm a CEO of a, a large established company, what do you tell me so I can, you know, focus on this problem? Hey, innovation is at the edges. Um, I'm focused on my business model. I'm not sure what to do. What would your advice be? Well, this gets back to the eight practices, actually, because the better CEOs, in other words, the ones that to me are really interested in the long run um, history, you know, long run success of their company, they're institutionalizing practices that make sure they don't get out of touch and to make sure they don't go into defensiveness. So um, it becomes a culture of curiosity a culture of let's really understand what's going on out there. And that gets backed up with practices, with metrics, with opportunities for people at the top level to come in contact with people who perhaps know things that they don't. Um, and this relentless curiosity that leads people to feel, you know, I can bring uncomfortable information or news to my leadership and I won't, first of all, I won't get punished for it, but secondly, I'll actually be appreciated for it, you know, that they'll be glad I brought them something they weren't looking at or thinking about. Um, and as you said, that's, that is a cultural thing. It's a mindset thing. You know, in a lot of companies, the mindset is very much, you know, don't bring me, and it's not stated this way, right, but, but don't bring me information that's uncomfortable for me to hear. Uh, and a lot of otherwise good companies have missed things because people were too scared to tell their senior executives what was really going on. So one of the things I, I see a lot is um, C C CEOs or leaders saying, hey, everybody needs to be an innovator. And then sometimes I think like that's pretty dangerous, right? You actually need some people focused on execution and you need some that really show that curiosity. And probably everybody needs to show the curiosity, but some, you know, can maybe go and explore. So often this term of, of ambidextrous organization that's world-class at execution and world-class at innovation comes up. How does that fit with the, the concepts you're writing a, about in your in your next book? Well, I think the the everybody needs to be an innovator idea. I think that has a certain amount of validity, but that doesn't mean that's their full time job, right? I mean, you know, I can be an innovative procurement person by perhaps I redesign right. my customer form so it's you know easier to do business with us than with our competitor. That, that I mean, that's innovative. But it's not, it's not going out and, you know, creating the next I don't know, sky, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but, but I think, I think, you know, giving people, giving everybody permission to be innovative in the way that makes sense for them, I think is what you want to go for. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The bulk of the organization at any given moment is going to be focused on, you know, getting on with the business of the day. Um, in terms of innovation being at the edges, I think the, the, the other thing that I think companies get wrong a lot is they impose the obligation to do something about an inflection point on the people that first see it. And they may be in no position to do anything about it. You know, they may be able to see it, but they're not the decision right, makers. Right. They don't have the resources. They don't have the teams. They don't, maybe they don't even have the skill set, right? They may not know what to do at all. But what you want is them to be able to have a place to go to 
bring what they're seeing into the conversation. And that's, I think, the harder thing to manage, which is, you know, don't like, like, you know, I'm sure you've seen this, Alex, where, you know, in a company, people say, oh, you know, be an innovator, do this. And then you say, well, I think there's a great opportunity to do something and I'll make this up, you know, Tunisia. And then they say, oh, congratulations, pack your suitcase, you're on your way to Tunisia. And that may be not be what you want at all, right? <laughs> So I think you want the conversation, but not necessarily link that to who's going to take action on this. Right, right. Who would you say, you know, beyond the usual suspects like Amazon that we all hold up as an example? And it's a great one, but I know you're working with a whole series of companies and, and probably most of them you can't mention, but what would you point out? Which companies would you point out as, you know, really companies that are doing a pretty good job, maybe just emerging, you know, in terms of how they address innovation? and showing this culture of curiosity. Are there some out there beyond the usual suspects that you, you, know, you can hold up? Well, you know, just it's fresh in my mind. I was just at the W.L. Gore Innovation Center, and I know you've done a fair amount of work with them over the years. Um, but they would be an example of a company that I think you know, really makes it a priority to have this pretty flat decision-making structure to, to recognize when established practices that work for the existing business don't work for the new businesses. They, they are very empowering of their leadership uh, in terms of being able to bring in new ideas and, and do new things. So I think Gore is a really interesting uh, case. Um, I would say, you know, a company like Spanx, right, which is a fabulous okay. entrepreneurial yeah. Success story, you know, they're, I mean, they've been very interesting in terms of the, uh, just, just figuring out increasingly what it is that women really want today, you know, that that's different from what, what we may have wanted in the past. I think they've been quite innovative. Um, so that's another interesting example. Now, if, if I'm a CEO and I, I say, okay, look, I have this 1 million I want to invest and, and, you know, the scale of things, that's probably not a lot of money, um, given that, you know, these larger companies, if they want to grow, uh, two, three, five percent, it actually means creating five billion of growth. But if I'm a CEO and I say, I have this one million, I want to invest well into innovation, can do a small thing, right? What would that be? What would you tell me to do with that million dollars? As a, as a company, as a sort of generic proposition? Yes, correct. Um, I would say figure out 10 to 15 small bets that you would like to seed. Um, and then figure out a way of getting people to to work on those. So a couple of examples here that I think are worth mentioning to your audience. So the first one is the Adobe Kickbox. Um, I don't know if you've run across that, but Adobe, by the way, is another yep, company yep. that I would I would put in that pantheon, you know, of, of companies that just are continually reinventing themselves. So the Kickbox is a red box. Um, and inside the box is a Starbucks card and a candy bar because all good innovation is fueled with caffeine and sugar, right? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also got a workbook. It's got a colorful workbook full of instructions. And the most critical thing it has is a gift card with a thousand dollar value on it. Um, and you as a, a, an employee can request a kickbox. Um, very few questions asked, the, the very few requirements, and no sort of particular screening or vetting on what you do with that thousand dollars. But the only requirement is that you have to give some input back to the kickbox system in terms of, you know, what you tried, what you learned, what are some possible lessons that someone else could build on. Um, and over the time, Adobe's given away about a thousand of these. So that would be about your, your million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, think about it. For that million, you've now got a thousand ideas right at the edges, as we've talked about. Most of which are going to be dumb ideas, right? <laughs> Most of which are not going to work. Mm -hmm. But For you sure. don't need them all to work, right? You need a small fraction of them. So let's say you've got, I don't know, a hundred out of that thousand or 50 out of that thousand that actually are onto something. And moreover, you've got lots of different people looking at lots of different angles of this. So let's say there's three or four or five ideas that are connected in some way. So now you can start to say, well, here's some critical mass around a concept. And what Adobe does, I'm told, is if there's enough attractiveness that comes out of the kickbox phase that you move on to get a blue box and nobody will tell me what's in the blue box, but <laughs> my, yeah, my suspicion, <laughs> my suspicion is that it's, it's the, the mechanics of beginning to actually get a venture or an idea to be 
become more considerable. So, you know, that would be an example of a, a very simple system. You know, it's not all complicated and, and, you know, heavy, heavy and lots of approvals and lots of documents to fill out. So a very simple system that, that gives the empowerment of having a bit of resource right out there at the edges for your people to take advantage of. I, I love that because it's one of the, the core messages that we're trying to get across with strategizers that you can't actually pick the winners. So you need to seed many ideas, give a little bit of money, and then you know, do follow-up investments based on what works, right? And you do this mm -hmm. maybe in two or three rounds. We like to call this uh, sprints, innovation sprints, mm -hmm. and have more of a venture capital approach for these new ideas, right? Because otherwise you're not gonna di discover those that could really work because they come from the edges. But, but this is very hard to kind of get across in companies because it's very different from the execution logic where you invest in one project and then you expect a return. Are you seeing leadership, you know, starting to understand that the investment logic of execution projects and the investment logic that you just, you know, um, explained really well with the Adobe Kickbox, are they starting to understand this or is this still one of the things that, you know, um, at the leadership level and not because they're stupid, right? But because maybe nobody told them in a very simple way that this is not rocket science. Are you seeing <laughs> that awareness now that, that these are different worlds and we need different kinds of investments? Oh, Alex, I have been trying to talk about this since 1995. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. This is one of my life's works. Um, I, you know, I do see greater awareness. I think um, if you think about the time that's passed since then, right, we've got certainly your thinking, uh, we've got Steve Blank, we've got uh, the, the, the whole lean startup design thinking, you know, that whole, there, there's lots of different pillars now that are starting to emerge of what this other world looks like and what, what's different about it, right? And we're starting to see it come together in a bit more of a coherent um, form. And so I, I do think that we have, um, I do think we have more awareness. Um, now it's not universal, it's still kind of patchy. And honestly, you know, a lot of people that run very large organizations today have never been exposed to any of this. You know, they got where they were by executing really well against very complex, challenging business conditions. And so um, you know, they have no personal experience with innovation. So, you know, I think we're not really gonna get to nirvana on this front unless having at some point had a personal lived experience of innovation becomes a requirement to get to the C-suite. Until that happens, I think we're still gonna have this disconnect. Yeah, right, so you, 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 you've been talking about this for a long time and, and you pointed out, right, that it's almost like we're at an inflection point, right, that more of this, you know, there are more methods or more people talking about it. You were one of the really early ones and you were a great inspiration for our work here. So what do you think, um, you know, changed that this is becoming more important there are more people talking about it maybe not yet more large organizations established ones actually acting but something seemed to have changed that this is more of a topic it's more at the center what, what do you think that is that this is uh, is really getting a bit a bit more visibility um even if it's not getting the required action yet well, I think if you go back to the world of sustainable competitive advantage, right, where you had an advantage and then you got to exploit it for a long, long time, to be perfectly blunt, you didn't need innovation that much. I mean, if you were an American company making tires in 1957, you were pretty much going to sell all the ones you made. And so the innovations were really around operational and technical things. And, you know, so DuPont would invent nylon, <laughs> you know, and then they would sell nylon for 60 years. Um, and so I think you know, as advantages have become shorter, uh, the pace of things has gotten faster. And I think the, the people are beginning to realize that they've got nothing to offer, you know, so the toolkit is bare, the cupboard is empty and, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do if this isn't our core business? And I think that is now touching more and more people. And the, the causes are pretty easy to identify, right? I mean, back in the day, you did not have global competition. You had the US, maybe a little bit of Europe. Um, India was closed, China was closed. You didn't have container ships, you know, shipping stuff cheaply across the ocean. You, you didn't have global trade. You didn't have digitization, which, you know, is a hugely disruptive 
um, influence on many, many industries. Uh, you didn't have this sort of global market for talent, global market for uh, services. So it was a very different world in terms of stability and what you could expect. And I think that shift has really got a lot of people um, uneasy. And where, where I see people sort of landing at the moment is, we know things have changed, we know things are different, we know the old rules don't work anymore, but we really don't know what's replacing them. And that, I think, has created a real interest in, in you might call it innovation, but certainly what's next in terms of strategy. So, so in our chat, a lot of people are saying, Alex, Alex, ask Rita about if we're gonna get a couple of those eight practices. So I'm forced <laughs> to ask, should, should we go into a couple of these? <laughs> Of course, of course. I know you and I could just babble, babble on all day. We could talk for 24 <laughs> hours, right? So, so let's get to some of those. We should do practices. that sometime. You know, we should have like like a binge talk. <laughs> right. Binge I, webinar. Excellent. <laughs> I'm up for that. I'm up for that. <laughs> okay, so um, eight practices. So the first one is, uh, and I'll, I'll do this in the form of questions. So, are you prepared to learn from the edges? So the first question mm -hmm. is, are you positioning yourself to come into direct contact with the edges of your organization. And as you get more senior, the challenges of doing that become more substantial. So let me illustrate. Um, a few months ago, there was a, um, a, a news report about the effort by certain U.S. retailers, namely The Gap, to provide their workers with more stable hours. You know, so workers in retail stores give them more stable hours. And this mm -hmm. newspaper reporter from the New York Times wanted to know why it was so difficult, like what made it so hard to give their workers stability. And the store manager replied with two things that I thought were pretty telling from a point of view of a leader. The first was, oh, corporate. He said, well, you know, we get these requirements from corporate that they're going to do a national promotion for skinny jeans, you know, and all the skinny jeans now have to go from the back of the store to the promotional aisle. And that takes time because, you know, that's an extra demand. And so we've got to do that by Thursday because the promotion is going to be rolled out on Friday and I've got to have everybody in the store moving the skinny jeans around. So that was the first problem. Second problem was even worse. He said, oh, second issue is corporate visit, executive visits. They said, you know, just last week mm -hmm. I had an executive in here and it took us three touch, three complete shifts of people working overtime to get ready. Now let that wow. sink in for a minute. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, the executive's trying to do the right thing, get out to the edges, see what customers are experiencing. But the store that you and I are in is not the store that executive's seeing. Yep. The store the executive yeah. is seeing is a store with, you know, three times the labor hours in it. Crazy. So this, right. this idea of how do you get to directly confront what's actually going on in your company. So unannounced visits, uh, go out and try to, you know, sit on your call center, uh, talk mm -hmm. to customers who are actually trying to purchase, go stand in the lunch line next to, you know, uh, people that mm -hmm. are buying. So that, that notion of direct contact is just irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. I think that's important just to quickly build on that, right? Some, sometimes when you know, we coach teams and the leaders say, okay, you know, who's, who's actually now going to talk to customers? We say, well, you better roll up your sleeves because you are the people who are making decisions, right? You need to get in touch because otherwise no decisions are going to happen. So it seems such a trivial thing, right? But it, it seems that established companies have a very hard time to get in touch with the edges with what's really going on. Exactly. And I think part of it is how we frame leaders work, right? I mean, if you think about it, is there a task in your company that's actually more important than finding out what's going on in your customers' minds? I don't think there is. And yet mm -hmm. we're running around having board meetings and do, dealing with email and talking about analysts. And, you know, we're, we're really not having the customer front and center of everything that we do. And that creates these incredible blind spots. Right. And it's such a, it's such a simple concept, right? But we still it actually seems that the more successful the business model, the further we move away from the customer, because we just, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take for granted that our initial assumptions were the right ones. And mm -hmm. as you pointed out, right, there's strategic inflection points where our initial customer assumptions might be completely wrong right? and we right. need to get in touch again. Or you were right for a while and now there's a challenge. So let me uh, share an example that um, is going on right now. And I'm writing about this, by the way, in my current monthly newsletter, which is about changes in the hospitality business. So take something like Airbnb, right? Phenomenally disruptive company, 
um, showed us there was this pent up demand for a different kind of you know, lodging experience than we've had, opened up the opportunity for people to make some money off real estate they already owned, yada, yada, yada. So that was great, right? And, and, and a lot of us were completely enthusiastic about Airbnb when it first started. So fast forward, and we've got a couple of things that I think could um, really undermine their business model. The first thing is what I'll call the professionalization of Airbnb. So you've now got people who said, hey, there's money to be made here in essentially running unregulated hotels without the hotel taxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to buy buildings now and I'm going to basically turn them into hotels. And in cities all over the world, this is now becoming a big problem, right? Which is mm -hmm. this sort of cute Airbnb model, which was supposed to be, you know, Aunt Minnie in her spare bedroom is now been replaced by actual operators who are capitalizing on the fact that this is, you know, that regulations haven't caught up with this model. So that's the first big change. Second big change is uh, the existing providers have now figured out that people have a demand for this. So there's a company called Booking.com, which is the parent company behind Priceline and Open Table and a bunch of these other like Hotels.com. Um, well, if you go to Booking.com, what you will find is they now list 1.4 million private homes as well as hotels, cruises, you know, whatever else you might need. So if you think about it from the point of view of the customer. So I want to travel to you know, Paris um, so I can go to the hotel site and see what hotels would offer me. And then I can go to Airbnb and research what Airbnb would offer me, then go back to the hotels and see if they're still available and go back to Airbnb. Well, nobody's going to do that, right? So I am highly likely to go to the one site where I'll get as much information as I need, make the decision, make it more conveniently and move on. Um, now, there's no way Airbnb, I don't think, is going to start listing hotel rooms on their site. They don't have the infrastructure. So you know, you talk about getting to the edges, right? It worked fine. It was a great model for a long period of time, but I think it's changing. And, mm -hmm. you know, are the people that are running that still operating on the assumption that, oh, you know, we've got this niche we've just opened up and that's still going to be ours to own? Maybe not. Right. And it, what's interesting is that, you know, disruptors like Airbnb have to think about once their business model come, becomes established, how are they going to think about the next wave, right? So they're, exactly. they're at the same risk, right? And once a business model works, you focus on that so much. And I do right. think they are doing a couple of things, but that's crucial, right? You can't just, you know, be happy with your, with your success. Okay, well, let's, exactly. let's try if we can get to another, sorry for, because I'm getting this pressure from our chat group. They, oh. they want to hear another couple of those practices. Okay. Absolutely. So the second one is making sure that as you're making decisions, um, uh, that you want to encourage, you want to obligate diversity of perspectives. And when I say diversity of perspectives, I don't mean the politically correct version, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are really coming at the problem from a very right. different place than you might be coming at it from. Because mm -hmm. one of the greatest ways to create a blind spot is to just have people that are just like you thinking about it. So I'll give an example there. Um, in New York City, um, there was a small team of, of very talented young people that had this great idea. It was to take all the payphone booths that were basically no longer used because people, you know, very few people use payphones anymore, and turn them into communication kiosks. It was a thing called Link NYC, and the original idea was right there on the street. You'd have unlimited internet access. You'd have a plug to charge up your phone. You'd have like a directory to local local sites and so forth. Um, and you could get information. And then this was going to be great, right? And it was all going to be paid for by advertising that would show on the outside of the kiosk. So the city of New York wouldn't have to dig into its pocket to build this. So this was all great. So these things go up uh, all over the city of New York. And <laughs> within 24 hours, homeless people are setting up living rooms around these kiosks and watching wow, unlimited wow. YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got guys like in tourist areas watching porn. <laughs> you've got so you much know, to unexpected, right? <laughs> well, well my, point, but my point is, had they had someone on that design team who actually mm. understood what goes on on the streets of the city of New York, you know, they mm. would have. Done, done this whole thing really differently. And it was a public relations disaster, right? So they had to completely mm -hmm. disable the internet functionality. And even today, there's a huge uh, debate because a lot of homeless people are actually camping out by these things and using the plugs and the electricity. Mm -hmm. And you know the mindset of the people building this, and I'm not being critical of them, I just think this is a very classic mistake you make when you've got a homogenous yeah. point of view. They assumed yeah people that would use these things would use them the way they would. <laughs> they yeah, would never yeah. conceive of sitting there all day long plugged in. <laughs> you know? 
And it, yeah. it points to a really big, big issue, right? That people don't question their assumptions. They don't accept that when you're doing something new, that there's uncertainty. They just believe what, because they're smart and they have experience, right? And they go in and they look at it as execution. So the diversity yeah. seems to help, right? With, with, with questioning the assumptions. Right. The, the third um, edge kind of thing is, do you really have small teams that are empowered to do exploratory things? So they're, they're entitled to go off and look at something for a bit and then come back and, and sort of let you know what, what they found or better yet, even take action on what they found. So empowering small and diverse teams. So I'll give an example from a company I worked with, which was um, we were trying to teach them entrepreneurial leadership. So these were people who were high potential people. So young people, they were yeah, say 30-ish would be their age. Um, but in the context of this course, what they were encouraged to do was form teams and go and look at some issue or problem that the company hadn't really um, considered. And that when, you know, when, when they came back, uh, there would be sort of an upvoting system. And the ideas that got the most votes, the company committed to implement them. Um, so that's, you know, that's a, a way of saying, you know, we're not going to give you the shop to run because they're, they're constraints that we're operating under, but we are going to empower you to go out and tell us, you know, a few things that we really ought to be taking some action on and notice of. Um, so that's an example of empowering small teams to bring back you know, information that might be of value to them. Um, another great example of this is um, the, the, the CEO of eBay uh, was considering making a change to the the website, right? And I mean, that's a big, big issue for eBay because, you know, you know, people don't like it when you rearrange the living room, right? Um, so, mm. you know, his young chief technology officer sort of said, here's what I think we might want to do. And the CEO said, okay, well, you know, come back to me with some kind of proposal. Well, this guy didn't just do that. What he did was he went around the company, found 12 of what he considered to be the very best developers, said, okay, guys, we're leaving tomorrow for Australia, which, you know, when you consider eBay's headquarters is in San Francisco, is about as far as you can get, um, and, mm. uh, and took the team away for two weeks. They did a massive sprint, you know, the way that you would advise, and they came mm. back with a prototype built. And at the time, this eBay CEO guy named John Donahue was just blown away. He said, you know, had I asked my typical team to do this, it would have been eight months and 40, 400 PowerPoint slides and, you know, 55 mm -hmm. analyst reports. These guys just went away and built something. And, okay, it's not perfect, but it's 80% it's of what we need. And they just did it. You know, they didn't ask permission. They just did it. And that's another, I think, great example of empowering these teams. Right. And it's so this concept, you know, sometimes people might say, oh, pretty obvious, but we don't see that in practice. Right. And the empowerment word there is the big one. Right. Small mm -hmm. and empowered. And one of the things that I'm wondering if you see this as well is that people want to have a big impact, you know, big return. So they think they need to invest in big teams and mm -hmm. taking the execution approach. But it's quite the contrary. Right. Um, do you see this empowerment happening a little bit more that we're starting to trust smaller teams to go make decisions and, you know, with different processes? Um, you know, it, it's all over the map. I'd say it's very uneven. Um, a lot of companies still have faith in the sort of marching army approach. And um, usually that's a mistake. It's, uh, well, it's always a mistake when things are really uncertain. I mean, I, I know very few cases with under high uncertainty where that approach makes any sense. Um, instead, what you want to do, and I think here you can take a traditional page out of NASA's book, you know, that when they decided they wanted to go to the moon, like I have this mental image of John, John F. Kennedy saying, you know, in 10 years, we're going to put a guy on the moon and bring him back alive. And, you know, I have this mental image of all these guys in Houston looking at each other going, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> but what Crazy. they did, but what they did, and this, you know, this obviously is a massive project. It's massive investment, massive discovery needed. I mean, a huge, huge, huge project, but they didn't treat it like a huge project. They said, okay, well, before we can get a man to the moon, the first thing we have to do is to be able to get a rocket out of Earth's orbit. You know, so how, you know, get a rocket off the ground, let's say. Well, let's take a small group and think about how we do that first thing, right? And, and once they'd successfully managed that, then they did the next step and the next step and so on. And eventually, as we know, they did get a man to the moon and bring them back successfully alive. Um, but, but it didn't happen as a big, huge, we know all the answers program. It happened mm -hmm. right. step by step. I like that because it shows, I mean, it's a brilliant example, but it shows that you want to take a big thing and break it down into smaller assumptions, right? 
And you, you try to work on one after the other rather than trying to solve the big thing. Again, you know, it seems almost like common sense, but it's actually not common practice at all, right? Breaking down these ideas. Okay, good. We're at three. Let's see if we can get to halfway through to, to the oh, fourth sure. one. Uh, so the fourth one. I love is, listening I, to you, so I I I, I hesitate sometimes to, uh, to to get us to move on. Oh no, that's right. Uh, the fourth one is back to this idea of are you giving people the opportunity to take little bets, um, and you know to to try small things. And the Adobe Kickbox would be a great example for that, right? So, do you have the resources? Do you have the encouragement? Do you have the permission to make a little bet on something? Learn what you need to learn, and then come back. So that's the fourth one. Okay. Then the fifth one is something Steve Blank says a lot. And I know you and I both uh, uh, agree with him. It's, it's, you know, there are no answers in the building. So get out, mm. you know, get out and, and get out of the building. See what's going on with your, with your customers, with your suppliers, with technology trends. So this would be practices like, um, and it's slightly different from the first one, which is direct contact with your customers, because mm. this one is a more generic kind of, are you positioning yourself to be exposed to things you don't normally get exposed to? So as an example, do you go to conferences that are not mm. part of your own industry? You know, do you, mm -hmm. do you have conversations regularly with people who have absolutely no idea what you do? Uh, do you, do you, you know, as a matter of routine, do you read um, publications that aren't directed at people just like you? You know, do you, do you read, mm -hmm. you, do you invest some time in learning, right? Do you come to an executive education course? Do you develop, you know, things that are quite different from what you're normally doing? So this notion of get out of the building, um, I think is really valuable. And that's more of a, general approach to your own development and your own uh, perspective than you know, the traditional kind of just get rewarded for uh, uh, you know, getting your job done. Comes back to the culture of curiosity, right? Going that extra length, being curious about and, and, and enjoying your job, right? Not just executing to kind of get your promotion, but right. going that extra length to want to be world-class. And, and again, that, that how you framed it with the culture of curiosity is something that I don't see enough. Sometimes I'm surprised that, you know, people in particular industries don't know exactly what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, disruptions at the edges. Very surprising. It is. It is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. Right. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, it, these things are not like, by the way, nothing I'm saying here should come as a complete and total, total shock to anyone. <laughs> um, and they're yeah. very simple practices and yet we don't do them. It's, it's astonishing. Exactly, exactly. So I like what Marshall Goldsmith, one of our, our common friends, likes to say, right? It's, it's sometimes common sense, but not common practice, right? So exactly. you just need to repeat this again and again. And, exactly. you know, hopefully leaders will, 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 uh, will move on and, and, and start to implement this in the organizational structure, right? It's all about getting, getting to start doing this. Okay, exactly. we're at five. Let's see if we, okay. can, if we can get to those three. Six is, are you creating incentives for people to tell you the truth? And here, what I'd like to Wonderful. use as an example is a corporate tragedy that sort of unfolded in several acts. And the corporate tragedy is the tragedy of Kraft Heinz. Um, so we had these two American iconic companies, Kraft and Heinz, that were traditional old line companies, right? They made good products for the middle class. They employed people with long tenure. And some would argue, well, they were just fat and happy. Um, and others would say, well, no, they were run like good companies trying to do good things. They were good corporate citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So this hedge fund, uh, 3G from Brazil, um, which has bought a lot of different companies and their recipe is very much, you know, zero based budgeting down to the bare bones, um, you know, just absolutely run things for Cost, 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 right? So essentially what they started to do at Kraft Heinz was to make those numbers and to make that really hard-nosed set of expectations on the part of their corporate overlords, um, they started to cut corners, right? They started to cut back on advertising. They started, they didn't invest in innovation. They didn't invest in their people. And to the point where there was a, um, a survey that was done by Glassdoor, you may know the, 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 the mm -hmm. they're like the, come, Employees can go there and talk about their jobs and they report on companies. And anyway, they did a, a survey of employees at Kraft Heinz and compared them to the other companies sort of in their categories with the percent of respondents who would recommend their company to a friend. And as of April, 
Uh, only 29% of the employees at Kraft Heinz would say they would recommend working there versus 70% at Nestle, 75% at General Mills, which are quite comparable mm -hmm. companies. So mm -hmm. if you take a step back and ask yourself, what's the incentive in Kraft Heinz for somebody to come up with an innovative idea or for somebody to say, hey, we're not doing this right or for somebody to actually bring the truth that customers' needs are changing to their corporate uh, leaders? They're not, there's no incentive. You know, their incentive is all about do whatever it is you're doing, but do it for less and do it for cheap and cut corners and you know, blah, 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 blah. And so as we saw very dramatically uh, recently, um, that they, they missed their sales targets by a formidable amount. They uh, lost, I forget what the number was, was, something like $15 billion in the quarter was below what they expected. They caused Warren Buffett, one of his biggest single day losses ever in his entire career. Um, and I would argue this is completely traceable to the fact that um, you know, you're not being incented to tell the truth. Yeah, and Ray Dalio talks about, a lot about that, right? That you want the best ideas to emerge in a company. You want people to speak up, not mm -hmm. something, again, an idea that you'd say, of course, but and not something we see implemented a lot, right? Absolutely. So the seventh topic is something I know near and dear to your heart, Alex, which is have we figured out how to get our senior team away from being in denial that there's a problem? Mm -hmm. And a classic story that you know you know as well as I do uh, is our colleague Alan Mulally. Uh, when he first came into Ford, you know Ford was set to lose something like seventeen billion dollars that year. <laughs> you know they were in deep dark trouble. Probably, he assembled yeah. his senior leadership team, and they had their performance numbers for that week in front of them, and they were color coded, right? So uh, green is good, red is pr problematic, and I don't know how, and yellow is mm -hmm. kind of I've got a problem, but I know how to fix it. And he comes in day one, and it's all green. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. That, that's that's the um, I love that story. It's unbelievable. Right. How can you put it on green All with that? And so he says, well, you know, people, is it our plan to lose $17 billion? Because if it is, we're right on track. And he has a phrase mm. that I think should be like on the wall of every senior leader's office everywhere. And his phrase was, you can't manage a secret. If we can get the data out there and we can understand what's going on, um, we, we can do something about it. But if we don't even know there's a problem, we can't manage it. And, and moreover, if we do know there's a problem, there's probably enough talent and creativity and you know, ideas in the room to fix it. But if we're all being mm. you know, sensitive and we wanna look good and we're afraid you know, that we'll be punished if we bring up these uncomfortable facts, we, there's no way we can use that collective intelligence. Amazing, right? I mean, it's all this about psychological safety and it, it does require a type of leadership, right? Alan Mulally, you know, this, you know, despite having so much success, remained humble and, and got everybody to speak up because it's not exactly. this kind of violent top-down management, right? No. That he likes to say you, you need to love him up, right? You need to have a very good relationship with people. I, I love that. It's a great example, him. great example. Yeah. And the last one, see, we are going to get to the last one, is uh, wow. drawn from um, the science fiction writer William Gibson's observation that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And the argument I would make there is how often do people really think about where is the future showing up that's not mainstream yet? So here's a, here's a statistical fact. If you want to understand how 20-year-olds are going to be behaving in 10 years, you actually have the entire population of people who will be 20 in 10 years alive and working today. Mm. <laughs> they are today's 10 year olds. <laughs> so mm. if you want to know how future, you know, the, where the future is, go talk to a 10 year old and, you know, how are they consuming information? What do mm. they look for in terms of who they trust? What, now, I mean, it's not going to be a predictive, right? But it will give you some ideas about what could be happening. And so, you know, I go to I go to a lot of conferences where you know, people talk about cutting edge technology. So just last night, I was at a conference at Columbia called the Digital uh, Dozen Awards, and this is a conference that's convened by my friend, um, by my colleague um, Frank Rose, and his thesis is that any new communication technology takes about 20 years before we figure it out. So when moving pictures first started to be um, possible, right? We didn't know what a movie was. So what did we do? We staged plays and we filmed them. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, for years yeah, yeah. until we figured out things like, well, you know, you don't have to film the movie in sequence. You can film scenes at different times, right? And then put them together afterwards. And I mean, simple things like that that are obvious to us now uh, took a long time to, to happen. So what I try to do is position myself 
to where bits and pieces of the future are already showing up, even though they're not fully developed yet. So um, the way I would phrase that is go talk to the future. I, I love that concept. And I love these eight, these eight practices, really. Um, did, were you able already, and again, I know you can't mention names of some clients, are, are you able to start implementing these with some of the leadership teams out there? Maybe without mentioning names, what, what would, sure. would you say was one of the most surprising stories that you've, uh, that you've uh, seen in the, in the last couple of months or years? Well, I actually did this exercise with a group of business leaders from the Young Presidents Organization, the YPO. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we put them into small groups and gave them essentially a worksheet, which said, hey, you know, go through all these and tell us what, tell us which of these you use, tell us your best practices, share among yourselves. Um, and they came back and they, there was one guy who was absolutely ashen and he said, oh my God, I'm not doing any of this. And, <laughs> and I could see this would be a big problem. So you have that moment of people really, really being confronted with the fact that if you look at how they're spending their time, they're not doing these things. So it's not all that surprising to get blindsided. Unbelievable, right? So I can't believe time is already up. Time flies. I, you know, I could just go on for hours and asking questions and listening to you, but I'll let Kavi wrap it up. Um, just maybe before we hand over to Kavi, um, can people already pre-order the book? They can, they can. We're just in the putting the finishing touches on it, but you're welcome to pre-order it. Uh, if you go to my website, readamagrath.com, and then backslash uh, seeing around corners, you'll get the book webpage and you can put yourself on the list there. Um, I should also mention, you know, I do run this weekly, this, sorry, run a weekly, monthly newsletter. Um, and what I do each month is, uh, and this is one of my personal practices for seeing around corners, right? I, I take a different sector or industry each month and ask the question, well, what, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the inflection points that could face that industry? So the most recent one was about the hospitality business and Airbnb's challenges you know, going forward. Uh, I've done them on, on food. I've done them on housing. I've done them on investments. I've done them on the power company. So if your readers are interested, uh, if your listeners are interested, they can sign up. It's free. Um, just sign up for the newsletter list, and that'll get them on. And uh, you know, I don't use the mailing list for anything else. It's really just people that are interested in, in this kind of thing and tapping into that resource. And I can really recommend it. If you hadn't brought it up, I would have. I would call it mandatory reading for anybody <laughs> who's in innovation. And anybody who's doing business these days should, you know, um, 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 start thinking about innovation. And you like to say, right, strategy and innovation is increasingly becoming a synonym. So please go and sign up for Rita's uh, newsletter. It's, it's brilliant. Now, Kavi, um, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you so much, guys. As always, it's always such an engaging conversation. Uh, Rita, a huge thank you again. You're always here to, uh, to come and chat about all the things that you w are working on, but also a good yarn, as we would say in Australia, with Alex on all the things that you guys get excited about. Um, mm -hmm. Holger, a huge thank you to you again for coming in and facilitating visually the conversation, a stunning job in just capturing the conversation as it happens. And Alex, as always, once again, thank you for hosting. To everyone that's listening, uh, you will get a recording of this session within the next 24 hours. And I will be sure to make sure that when you get this recording in your inbox, you're gonna get a link uh, to Rita's uh, book, the landing page to her book, the chance to sign up, and also to get to her newsletter. You'll also get access uh, to a link that will take you to our new book, at Strategizer, the invincible company. Uh, so you can sign up and be updated on that. Until then, everybody, uh, we're gonna sign off now. Again, Alex, Rita, Holger, thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.